Hello, everyone. I am so happy you're here. I'm Jacob Nordby. I'm the producer of the Heal Plus Create Writers Retreat. And um, I'll be meeting all of you online or in person in a couple of weeks or three weeks in California and online. So I'm very excited about that. And I, I was so happy when Annie Lamott offered to do a Q&A with us. It's so generous and she's very busy. And so I'm just excited that we get to meet her like this today. And I didn't realize um, when she made the offer that she thought she and I were just going to be doing a Q&A and posting it on Facebook. So this morning, I, I had this moment of horror that said, oh, no, <laughs> I've invited all these people. And she's very graciously said, no problem, we will get right in and do it. So we're just going to um, introduce Annie Lamott in just a moment. And I'm sure most of you she does not require an introduction, so I won't spend a long time with her um, credentials, but you probably know her. I'm going to hold up my copy of Bird by Bird. You probably know her because of uh, reading one of her amazing books. Um, I'm so excited that we get to experience her in her teaching role, you know, at the retreat. But I'll read just a little bit off the back of Bird by Bird. For over a quarter of a century, more than a million readers, scribes and scribblers of all ages and abilities have been inspired by Annie Lamott's lively, big-hearted, homespun advice. Advice that begins with the simple words of wisdom passed down from her father, also a writer, in the iconic passage that gives us the book its title. So I am going to have all kinds of people coming in, and I can see you coming in from Chicago and Rhode Island and California, and we'll let a bunch more folks in now. And I'm going to ask Annie if you can go ahead and turn your mic and camera back on. Annie, then we will. I think I'm back on. There you are. Hello. Hi. Uh, I have 45 whole minutes, so no worries. I just have a getting over a, a chest cold that never leaves, and so I'm hoarse, and I'm just trying to save my voice a little bit for recording, but I have 45 minutes. So oh, let's thank get you. this show on the road. Let's get this show on the road. Well, <clears throat> Annie, I have a, I think I may have mentioned this when we were at Home Depot looking for shower doors, but I have a personal story with Bird by Bird. I was, I had gone through a tremendous breakdown part of my life a dozen years ago. And I was, had moved from Boise where I live to Austin, Texas, didn't have a job didn't know where I was going to start. And I, I knew that I wanted to start writing, which was a childhood dream. And um, I got a job and I was working in a warehouse all by myself. It was so lonely that even the spiders got discouraged and either died or went away. My mother sent me a copy of Bird by Bird. And she said, Jacob, you'll love this book. And she probably didn't know it at the time, but reading Bird by Bird as the very first newbie little writer um, probably saved my sanity and it might even have saved my life. And I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but I was in a pretty tough place. And I, so I just want you to know that working with you, sharing you with everyone is a dream come true. And I love your work. And I know I'm looking at all these smiles on the cameras out there right now. So thanks for being here. And where should we start? We have 45 minutes. Now you have 40. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'd love, I, I don't, have the technological ability to um, get questions on chat because my son and grandson are gone. <laughs> but if you, if anyone has questions on chat, and I can just talk for a few minutes too because the first yeah. questions are always hard. But if you see a question, you could ask it. That's the best I can do. Um, so, and also there are two dogs here. And I can't leave them in the house because they the puppy eats everything. So every so often it will appear that I am striking a dog, which is not exactly true. I am trying to push the dog away from the puppy from my books and stuff that she's eating in here. Okay, here she comes now. Okay, you've met her. So um, let's see. Um, I am so excited about this. Um, Heal, and heal plus create thing for a number of reasons. One, because I love Julia Cameron, you know, and I've been teaching these writing workshops once a year at Book Passage in the around Mother's Day. And, and um, I always have the um, owner, Elaine Petricelli, who's handling books for you too, Jacob. Mm -hmm. She, I also, we have to check to see what the puppy's eating. Oh, that's fine. Um, I have her buy a hundred 
uh, artist ways because it's just so profound and lovely and welcoming and gentle. And whenever I talk to um, people about writing, they always mention that it was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. And then Sark, how can you not love Sark? She has just been one of those presences, one of those beings in the world who has made me laugh and and uh, kind of smite my own forehead with insight with her beautiful wild illustrations. So, um, and I'm excited that you and my son Sam are doing it. Hmm. Can I just make a quick plug that if any of you need recording studio time, Sam, um, who's work, who's doing this with Jacob and, and recording it and whatnot, has a studio, studio called Square One Studios where I'm recording bird by bird. And um, it's highly professional. He does weird stuff like uh, like collage, like uh, what's it called? Scrapbooking, but with video. So you or your family just, instead of having to write it, which is a nightmare, you just show up and get taped and then they edit it. So just get in touch with Jacob if you're interested in um, any recordings, um, audio books, memoirs, anything. Okay, I see a ton of questions, but again, I don't have the ability to, to um, do anything about that. Shall I read a couple to you, Annie? Sure. Okay. And this also, when I read it out loud, the people who are catching this by replay will get the benefits. They won't be able to see the chat. Um, there are so many. Um, I'll just grab a couple as they come through in the stream. Um, Maria from San Diego says, what is your daily routine around writing? What does it look like? Um, when I'm in the middle of a book or starting a book, I sit down at the same time every day. I am a person who does very well with structure. I don't wait for insight. I don't really believe in insight for me. I, um, I sit down and I have something on the desk. You can see this is the little audio visual thing that is a, um, a suggestion of an, uh, one passage, one section, one theme, one idea, one memory that I know I can sit down and do. So I don't sit down you know, with blank paper, which is like facing an, an assaulted ice flow. <laughs> and um, and I just start writing. And if you've read Bird by Bird, I just sit down. I have a lot of discipline. Discipline for me is the way to freedom. And I start writing. I give myself a couple hours. I take, I, oh, I, I know one thing. This is helpful. I do bribes and threats. So I say to myself, if you get this one passage written, this one section, um, then we'll stop and watch MSNBC for 10 minutes or we'll get up and, and make half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, even though we're not really hungry. We just want that. So um, discipline and bribes and threats and start and have something by the desk that is something that you actually wanna write and think you might be able to just write really badly. The secret of life is shitty first drafts. Are you going to read another question? Oh, I sure am. I just didn't want to jump in and interrupt you. Um, so would you talk about how you hang on to the courage to tell the hard stories? Um, well, you know, I always tell my writing students to write what they like to come upon. So if they like to, to read uh, confessional novels or, or memoirs or... Um, books on creativity or whatever, write that. And I happen to love when a writer will do the deep dive into what is true about life here, what is true for us as human beings, how we are to live, what is absolutely meaningless to keep pursuing. And um, so I, this is the stuff I talk about with my friends and in recovery and with my people at church. And so I, um, I just love to, to read it. So I try to write it. Now it's not my most intimate stuff, obviously. I mean, I don't, I, uh, I think of it as having kind of a bullseye in the center, which is me, my little kid, my higher power. And then, and the first ring outside the bullseye is what I might tell Neil or my husband or Sam or my best girlfriend. And then two circles out, I might tell a bunch of people you know, if we were cruising around in the car, Jacob, like we were, we, we really shared a lot of stuff about our life. And, uh, and then three things out, I would tell more people that I'm not, you know, 
four people out I'll, I'll write about because everything I have ever written or um, shared, even if it sounds really seems really intimate and confessional, I know by the time I write it, it's universal. So it's just what I do. This is I just sit down and I, I do it. So this is an interesting one because I know this topic is so out there right now, Annie. It's it's in the zeitgeist in the collective conversation a lot. How to turn mental illness or struggle, emotional struggle, into art? Well, that's a really good question. My best advice would be to read books um, that you have loved or been very moved by or have heard about that are about that very topic that people that have had um, extreme struggles. I mean, the same is true with extreme childhood struggles mm -hmm. with chaos um, and loss or abuse and or <clears throat> And read how other people have done it. You know, read how other people have structured it. Some people go back in time and then forward to what they've learned about it now or um, where they're bogging down or not getting anywhere with it now. Just you read, you sit at the feet of the masters and you fit. And also, here's another thing you just write an incredibly shitty first draft. <laughs> and then you share it with people. You, you really can't get anywhere in your writing if you don't have a partner or a small writing group. That's the most valuable things that come, come, thing that comes out of my um, book passages at book passage writing workshops is that people form little clusters, usually people who, whose writing they like and who, and it's like you say, you would say, Jacob, um, I'm starting a little writing group. We're gonna meet at a bookstore Every, two, every second Thursday, and we need to have gotten the five pages we're gonna work on to, every, to the other three. And I'd like your, your honest feedback on, on what works or doesn't, or um, what you'd like more of, what you'd like less of. So um, you kind of, not to sound like the Nike ad, but you kind of just do it and you write a really shitty first draft and you do it bird by bird, you do one, really short passage at a time, really one memory, one, one section. And it might just be way, 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 way too personal. And, uh, and take some of it out. But everything in us is trying to get us not to write. You know, our parents are not gonna, your parents are not gonna be glad to hear you writing a memoir, believe me, no <laughs> one in your family is. And um, so you just do it as a radical act of healing and truth telling. And then people will help you know what, uh, what might need to um, be changed or um, um, shaped in some different way. I have to look out at the dogs, but you can get your next question. <laughs> I am doing that. Okay, okay, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Well, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Kind of following right along with what you were just saying, Annie, and I know you addressed this quite a bit in Bird by Bird. Um, one question is, how do I get over the fear of hurting people when I'm telling my radical truth? Well, that's a great question. I think probably a lot of people will talk about it at the retreat at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, I've always said that you own everything that's happened to you. And if they wanted you to write more warmly about them, they should have behaved better. <laughs> but the thing that I know is that everything in you is trying to keep you quiet, like it did when you were a child. Mm. And so you just write it, you get it down on paper. And then, um, and then you go back with a trusted friend, somebody that will help you edit and you, make decisions you know t t one truth at a time is this okay or <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> where you write a novel <laughs> or a screenplay you make it fiction what i've always done in novels i've used everything from my family but you um you make it be a different family you make it be the funny japanese family down the street or you make it be the Catholics with eight children over in the, the next town over, or you um, 
if you change people's physical, the description, <coughs> you make people blonde who are brown, brown haired. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm gonna have a cough drop now. I'll have some water. You change everything about them and, and most people, no one's ever noticed that I've used what they said verbatim. If you change their height. <coughs> okay. So I want to, I have, obviously we have many more questions, but I also um, am very sensitive to the fact that you're getting ready to spend a day in studio reading a book. So no, um, it's not till it's not today. Okay. You're coming up okay. and I don't have a great voice, but okay. Uh, well, this one, this one, and I've experienced <laughs> oh, Annie, um, participating in a memoir a writing class in a in part of a group got the act of writing and it was so involved with focusing on other people's stories and giving them feedback i lost my desire to write my own how do i pick the thread back up and get back to me and start writing just for me it's really hard it's a great question well <coughs> my experience is that this is really a psychological and spiritual question hmm. because everything I've ever done until, until recovery, I got sober in 86. Everything was about trying to get other people to give, to esteem me and to think that what I was doing was valuable. And um, excuse me, I'm so sorry, I'm kind of a mess. <sighs> Um, and everything in me was focused outward. Is it okay if I do this? Uh, I'm not sure I'm good enough yet, right? How do you get good at something? You start out, you don't start out with piano lessons because you want to play the farmer in the dell. You know, you want to play Bach. Mm, everything was about whether the men would be okay with what I was writing, whether my mom and dad would be, whether my aunt Eleanor would be okay. And um, you know, they aren't anyway. <laughs> so what's the point? So at some point you do the work, the spirit. That's why I think the retreat is healing plus because it's about finding both your own voice, which just takes practice and mm -hmm taking out what isn't your voice, noticing all your affectations or ways that you have of talking or presenting that you think makes people, you know, I do all this ridiculous, I used to more, all this bullshit so that people think I was more educated than I am, you know? I mean, life is so fleeting. Mm. This is how I sound. I mean, everyone here today, this is what I sound when I'm sick. When I write my books, that's what I sound like at whatever age it was that I wrote them. And so you just start doing whatever the work is, therapy, recovery, women's or men's groups, to stop doing anything so that other people will think you're of value. It's an inside job. The respect that we struggle for always thinking it's out there like the fda could give you a stamp of approval you know if you do it it doesn't work it's like a hit it's a fix mm. and it wears off and so you just keep going deeper and deeper and finding out what you actually want to do and where you're going to start and learning to give yourself so much permission to be exactly who you are and not who your parents wish you were or had hoped you would be when you grew up. So for me, it's like, it's it's not, I, I could literally write a whole book about this. It's, um, it's a deep spirit. It's the reason you're here for one thing. Mm -hmm. And it's so profound. And then it becomes such a gift for others for you to start doing what you feel called to do by the inside voices or by God or by your own beingness, that this is what you are gonna do. Mm -hmm. And if someone has a problem with it, then they have the option to go get therapy too. 
Oh, I, I'm reading this next question and it um, reminds me of where you write in Bird by Bird about the imagination that one day when you're published, that day the trumpets are going to blare and then ever after that you'll never be insecure or anything again. So Maria says, how do you consider yourself a writer if you haven't published a book yet? How do you believe in yourself? Well, the obvious question is, if you're writing, you're a writer. <laughs> and if you, you know, my talk is going to be on the debt of honor, that if you're honoring that voice inside of you that always wanted to write or used to write or thinks you might be good at it or just wants to get it all down, you know, to save, save it for your grandchildren or your nieces and nephews so that they know what life was like when you were in the you were at Vista or when you were in the Peace Corps or when you were a child in a small town and you knew the name of every single dog on the block. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, I mean, a, a lot of us that are ever so slightly less young um, who grew up in the 50s and early 60s, you just left the house when you were six years old. Mm -hmm. You got on your bike and went to someone else's house where the food might be better. <laughs> And, um, and your, it wasn't like a big deal. It was just, your parents would call them, oh, did Annie get there? Are you gonna keep her for lunch? So you wanna write about that because it's so beautiful. And so you, I just wish I had Nike, those Nike post posters from earlier that just said, you just do it. And if you're doing it, you're a writer. If you're just writing a little bit every day, you know, it's hard for people have extremely busy lives. And <clears throat> I can tell you that when I did these book passage things in person, I would spend, you know, a third of the time listening to people explain to me why they weren't writing, why they couldn't write. They had a child at home. They had a, they had a job, a full-time job. And, it, and I always said, oh, that's fine. You don't have to write. Here's the thing. No one cares. No one cares if you write or not. So if, you, if you're going to write, you have to do it. You have to find me an hour five days a week. What, when would that be? Well, I'd say, how often do you go to the gym? I go four times a week. Could you give me two of those? No, I mean, I feel really, really good after I go to the gym. I understand. Mm -hmm. You'll feel really, really good after you write. Uh, what do you do after dinner? I watch TV. Well, I do too. What do you do at nine? What do you do at 10? I watch the local news. Can you give me that? Can you give me three nights a week and not know where all the local fires are? You know, and you stop not writing. And as soon as you stop not writing, you're a writer. Hmm. I'm going to just say that again, because I, I let it go in my ear so quickly. As soon as I stop as soon as I stop not writing, then I'm a writer. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, I love that. Anastasia says, I have a hard time saying my essays are finished because in my mind, they are never good enough. This has prevented me from submitting or putting my work out there. How can I move past this perfectionism so I can pursue my writing? Mm, oh, that's a great question. There's a whole chapter in Bird by Bird called How to Tell When You're Done or something like that. I don't think I have it here. The puppy's probably eating it. I should, right? <laughs> oh, well. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> at some point, th there's also a chapter in Bird by Bird on perfectionism and that it's a voice of the oppressor and the voice of the enemy. And it's a perfectionism that will ruin your life and make you crazy. Um, and trying to get a piece perfect starts to hurt it. Oh, you have it there. Yeah, um, I was looking for it. <laughs> Um, there's a point at which you've gone over it, you've done it the best you can, you've given it to a couple people to read and mark up for you, you've done a second and third draft, you gave that to someone you trust, they made tiny changes and they love it. You just take a long, quavering, deep breath and you send it to somebody, you send it to an editor, you send it to an acquisitions editor at a magazine. It, and it's so painful. And when I don't hear back 10 to 15 minutes later, <laughs> I just assume they hate it and that 
it's never going to be published and that I'm just a total loser and the well is run dry, whatnot. But um, that's the craziness of being a writer. And that's some of the very, very best material we have to offer. Annie, I suspect you won't hate this next question because you recommended books to me. Um, in fact, I have a copy of your friend's oh. book, A Crooked Smile. It, it arrived. And I, I know that uh, Terry is going to be with us in this retreat. But this question is, um, says, I just listened to Bird by Bird. Uh, so, so excellent. Are you still a thriller junkie or what do you read or recommend others to read today? Um. I just really want to plug a, a Crooked Smile by Terry Tate because it is exhibit A hmm. in how we get it done. Hmm. And she used to come, she's had, the reason it's called a Crooked Smile is that 25 years ago, she had a basically unsurvivable oral cancer and they removed most of part of her jawbone, just everything and took pat pieces from elsewhere and tried to rig it. So she's a beautiful woman, but hold up the cover again. Yeah, and I'll put a link to find it also. Yeah, you can, she has a very crooked smile. Mm -hmm. And um, and so she talks about writing and surviving and the spiritual path of healing from cancer. And she's very funny, you would like her. But she started coming to my workshops at Book Passage when there were 40 people, plus just Riff Raff, which is my, my friends in the very back. And she got this funny little writers group together. And I am not making this up. They have met every second Thursday for 20 some years. Wow. It was people whose work they liked and who could make take who had that debt of honor to wanting to write their stories. And she just wrote snippets and bits of it. And she told you the story of one operation or she told you the story of the end of one marriage or she told you know over and she bring those in week by week and um and then pretty soon and this is a promise the inside structure will start revealing itself to you okay i'm only writing short stories could this be a novel well there's many many beautiful novels that are connected short stories um i believe my mind is going to go blank now um so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blaming it on the cold rather than my dotage. But, um, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Anyway, there are a lot of beautifully um, cohesive novels that began, uh, Hard Laughter was all short stories for the seven, first seven chapters. But the structure will reveal itself to you. And so she did that, she just stuck it out and little by little, this structure started appearing and she spent 10 years getting it just right. And then she sent it off to however, you know, 15 agents who all rejected it. And then one fell in love with it. And then they sent it off to, you know, 15 publishers, 14 of whom rejected it. And sounds true, a totally great press published it. So um I forgot the question, but I hope that that somehow answered it. Well, you actually answered a couple of questions because there's okay. these some questions and they're asking about how yeah, do we get some, to I just see on chat, some of uh, Lahiri's works are collections of short fiction stories. Who, uh, what, what's Elizabeth Strout's most famous book? We all loved it. And Frances McDormand played her on TV. Someone in the audience, it was on a, um, oh, I can see people starting to type. I believe those were connected short stories. Uh, all of Kitteridge. Thank you, Carol Adler. You should give her like a washer dryer or something. <laughs> all of Kitteridge was connected short stories. So, um, but what I started to say was the, the structure, this is my belief and it's a little woo woo and you might not believe it, but I believe the material knows what it's up to. I believe with fiction, your characters know who they are and they're gonna keep tugging on your sleeve and telling you more if you can be trusted to get it down mm. and get it down the way it comes through you from them. I believe the structure knows what, it's, knows what it is and it will reveal to it to you as soon as you have created the discipline and the, the container and the um, 
the daily commitment to it, you'll, it's so weird. You, you, you won't be trying to self-will it into existence, a structure or a, whether it's fiction or nonfiction or whatever. It'll, be, it'll always be very inconvenient. You'll be at a cocktail party or church or something, or you'll be at the temple and all of a sudden something will float into your head like a goldfish and it will be the solution. And you'll go, oh, for God's sakes. That is really funny. I have an apology to give to Lynn, who really did mean word by word, not bird by bird. Oh, and there is a word by word thing. Yeah, so I'm going to drop a link to that Audible program. Um, so thank you. Yes, she was saying that there's, there's a lot of really good information in that program. Sorry, Lynn, I did not mean to edit you inappropriately. That's where you write back and say, Stet, uh, I meant that. What are the first steps you take in identifying main characters? I don't know how to answer that except to say I always just kind of know. Like with Rosie, which was my second novel, this child, this kid just appeared to me and she had black curls, I had blonde curls and she had soft ropey curls and I had much more kinky curls and she was really, really, really skinny, which I was. She had piercing blue eyes and I had green. And her father had just died, Andrew. She's about six and my father had just died, although I was 25 when he died. And, um, and I just saw her and I knew what her name was. Isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. I, Cause I was open for business. So you need to do whatever ritual it is with you and the universe and your inside self, whether it involves candles and incense and the God box or a top drawer of your desk or whatever and to, on, on which you can scrib scribble that you're open for business. Mm -hmm. And when you are, I, if you're going to write a novel, I think people will start appearing. If you're going to write a memoir or nonfiction book on, on some topic that you have to like rush, like whatever you happen to be really, really knowledgeable about, it's like putting up, a, you know, having somebody sink a post hole for you and putting a mailbox on it. it if you're open for business, the material will start arriving. And uh, with, I, I was still drinking at the time. This is my 20s when I was writing Rosie. And I want to write about uh, alcoholism. And I saw her mother, her mother's very tall and gorgeous. And I didn't feel I was either and very alcoholic, which I was. And I can write about alcoholism mm -hmm. till the literal cows come home. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I saw her mother, her mother's very depressed, which I'm not, I'm much more on the anxiety um, scale. And I just saw them. And then I saw that the only hope the mother had, which is the only hope any of us ever have, was that she needed a, a great friend. And so one day there's a knock on the door and she goes to answer it. And I don't know who's on the other side. <coughs> but it turns out to be her new best friend who, um, <coughs> who introduces herself and announces that her name's Ray with an E. She announces that she believes she and Elizabeth will be inseparable. And then all of a sudden three books are off and running, Rosie, uh, Crooked Little Heart and Imperfect Birds. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I'm gonna drop a quick plug in for Sam too and Annie. Um, just it's, here's a link to Sam's studio. Sam will be presenting on the, the Sunday of the retreat. So I'm so excited about that. Um, talking about don't write that book. I won't elaborate now, but just so much fun to get to know Sam. Um, how about, how about, I'm curious about your take on this, because I certainly hear different opinions. Do you, when you're writing your first draft, do you do it on your computer or by longhand and, and why? For, I, I write everything now on the computer, mostly the iPad and mostly on the bed with the kitty. <laughs> and um, I've just got, it might be laziness or old age, or it just might be, I, I don't know how long I'm going to live, but I want to be really comfortable. <laughs> and I love my room and it's really safe. And Sam and Neil and my grandchild know that if the door's closed, I'm not open for their business, which is, is there anything to eat? Or could you put my clothes in the dryer when the wash, you know? And so, but if you look here, I mean, I can just show you, I have so much stuff. Can you see this, Jacob? Is it mm -hmm. showing up? Oh, okay. yeah. Um, 
its notes, its scribbles. I just hid this one thing so that nobody here would see it in case the camera zoomed in. But it's got like coffee all over it. But these are incredibly important notes to me. They're on all, this is on the back of something um, that I love, that I want to save. Uh, look, this you'll love. Look at this. These are, I take notes. I, you know, when you're, I always talk in my writing workshops about how when you're young, everybody says, if it's important, you'll remember. And it wasn't true when I was seven and I had an early menopause and it was, has never been less true since I was 50. And if it's important, if it comes through me, I get it down. And so I have tons of notes, but then when I do, one thing that might be helpful that is something I do is that I always, and of course I don't have it now when I say I always do this, I always have a legal pad along, around because it's longer. I, I don't know what it is, but it might, maybe it's 14 inches instead of 11. And I scribble down things I might be able to write. I scribble down memories that I really don't wanna lose. I wanna write about my uncle Don when he was so drunk at the little pond in Inverness when I was five, when my brother almost drowned. And I can write Uncle Don Inverness um, in the pond. And I, and I make lists on these of stuff that I'm going to do. And I screw, oh, here's another thing I do. This is really valuable. I pick people's minds to help me with material. I have a couple of friends and Neil, my husband, who is, are so articulate. And, um, and I asked them, talk to me about uh, what this purple bag uh, full of weird stuff, let's go through it. What does it look like to you? How can, how, why do I think this is a bag of love? Can I take out, here's some socks, socks are love. You, you don't know what to get someone, a close friend or a relative or somebody with one year sobriety, get them socks, trust me on this. <laughs> um, and I asked people to help me and then I, I get it down. I don't remember stuff I mean to. I'll be in line at, uh oh wait, the puppy's eating something under my desk. What do you have? Uh, an accident, mm -hmm. uh, a, mis, an, a misunderstanding. Um, I hear somebody in line at the express line at the health food store and it's hilarious and I write it down. You know, Mukti, leave it. Um, leave it good girl um i don't want to uh be too harsh in front of everybody um anyway um so i forgot the question again did that answer it <laughs> i think so okay and i think we're coming up to the end of our time but i just uh here's here's one here's one i think will be really interesting i mean all of these are fascinating questions and by the way those of you who come to the retreat um, I'll be making as much space around myself as I can so we can chat um, and talk through publishing questions and things. But um, here's, uh, is it bad writing to just say it like it is? And, and my sense is, Annie, that you'll be able to kind of read behind that question and even know more about what's being asked there. Um, Jacob, is it possible for you to somehow um, record the questions that have come up in chat? Yes without having to write them all down? It is? Yeah, I can I can um, download this and send them over later. Oh, okay. Because during that three days, I'm sure we can just, um, you and me, mm -hmm. um, sit down and answer more of them on a Zoom or something like that. Because these are, I can see these questions. Mm -hmm. They're great. Um, I forgot the question you asked, but- Well, um, yeah, and there were, I could feel into it. Is it bad writing to just say it like it is? So is it bad writing to say it like it is? To me, no, but I don't necessarily want to read what you've written because if you're anything like me, you write really long. Mm -hmm. So that, say this Uncle Don out at the pond at Inverness when I'm six, uh, five, um, I might, it might take me nine pages to write it, all the details. You know, it's funny because I've gotten so absent-minded and um, it flies off and down, but I can remember this sun suit I was wearing. It would have been 1959. And my baby brother would have just, Steve-O, who's now 63, would have just been born. I can remember the pattern of this sunsuit. We all wore the older, all you older people, we wore the sunsuits that tied at the shoulder 
and they had an elastic band at the waist and at the legs. I can remember the pattern. Isn't that funny? <laughs> because it was important to me because I loved it. And um, so I'm going to describe all of that and then say, I give it to one of you. And you might say, you know, it's very touching that, that the whole page you wrote on that sunsuit. But um, I think maybe you need to pick up the pace there a little bit. And I think what to me is interesting about the sunsuit is this and this, and uh, um, <coughs> that it had been repaired because the family didn't have enough money to keep, you know, to buy a new one, or it was brand new and it was scratched or whatever. So that you were, if you're like me, you write long, of course you write exactly like it is. And I have one question I'll um, ask myself, and then we can close with this because um, I am losing my voice. Um, so you, you write long, just get it all down. Let me just reiterate, everything in you wants you to not write. It wants to keep you quiet. It doesn't think that what you think happened actually happened that way. It wasn't that bad or whatever. Mm -hmm. And everything in you is trying to block you. So you sit down and you just do it. And it's not going to the publisher. It's don't put it online. Give it to somebody that you trust to read it for you. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you, you know, I can promise you everything I've written is too long by a third. By a third. I take a deletion is a huge part of creativity. Taking stuff out is a, you know, the Jessica Midford, the great nonfiction writer said, um, you must kill your little darlings. And it means you go through and you take out stuff you just love so, 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 so much, little quotes or little observations. And, and if they're in the way or they're inauthentic or they're just, you put them in so you'll see more area diet or more ironic or whatever you're aiming for, uh, you take them out. It's so painful. But you save them for something else. You know, you'd be really nice to yourself. You'd be in general with your writing the way I would be with Jacob say, where I wouldn't say, Jacob, this is so long. And I got to tell you, lost me on page five. And I wouldn't say that. I'd say, you know what? This is going to be wonderful. I don't think you need to describe the swimsuit you were wearing when you were five years old. And it turned out you were at the same pond with my Uncle Don. Um, I think maybe one, one very short paragraph about why you loved it so much and you wore it when you needed to feel stronger and less afraid in the world. I think that's what we're, you were after all that time. And you talk to yourself <coughs> again and again with, this, with encouragement. You know, it's like Dr. Spock, for those of you who read him, the writer, not, I mean, the, the pediatrician, not the old can or whatever he was. He said with two-year-olds, you be firm, but friendly. And that's how I am with myself, with my writing. I'm firm. No, you can't get up right now. We'll do that later. Um, uh, just keep going. It's going to be fun. It's going to be good. Just keep going and then we'll get to half a peanut butter salad sandwich. Okay, I have one more question and then I just really have to go. Um, people really want to know the difference between writing um, nonfiction and fiction or novels and memoirs or whatever. And all I can say is that I always kind of know that, and first of all, a novel is going to take you three solid, hard years to get a presentable draft together. It's going to take you one whole draft, which is going to be at least a year, maybe 18 months, to even write a shitty first draft and know, know who your characters are. It really is. It's kind of miserable. So if you want the uh, instant gratification, um, write a memoir or write nonfiction, write essays, write whatever short pieces for that might have a have a connective tissue or collagen to bind them all into a book. Um, I somehow just sort of know you need to have a lot of stamina to write a novel. If you have it or you're halfway through a novel, God, keep going. There's not a writer on earth who's not really, really jealous of you. Are you a part of a novel written or a really shitty first draft finished of a novel? And, uh, and then you push back your sleeves and you go through it and you take out stuff that maybe you can use elsewhere, but that is impeding the flow of your narrative and you put it aside and you 
see if stuff um, could be a little bit better and you jiggle it and you, there's a thing in bird by bird that the first draft is the, uh, I forgot, the child's draft. You just get it all down. The second draft is the adult draft and you go through it a little bit sternly, but friendly. And you take out all the stuff that really doesn't go there. And the last draft is the dental draft. And you go tooth by tooth and paragraph by paragraph. You wiggle it and jiggle it and floss it and see if it's going to be healthy. Mm. So um, I have to go. Annie, thank you so much. And I'm going to invite um, everyone to stay on just for a minute so I can make sure you're aware of some resources we have for you. But let's all in chat and I'll download the chat and send it to you later, Annie. Let's just all in chat put a heart or a quick thank you and because this was a really big surprise when you offered to do this and thank you so much for so showing welcome. up for us so yeah welcome. we can't wait to see people <laughs> in person or on an even bigger screen yes Bye, i'm everyone. seeing lots of love come back just to you thank you Annie. just do it just do it just do it okay we'll talk to you soon have a wonderful weekend okay honey bye bye all right, I'm so happy. Those of you who want to stay just for a minute. I want to share my screen in a second and show you a couple things. And thank you so much for being here and asking these great questions. I just I love you. I love I love us, all of us who are committed to our craft to finding out what's true and alive inside of us. And um, that's what makes me tick. So um, I'll make sure that Annie gets this whole chat um, transcript. But I'm just want to, you know, I'm just looking here at the screen and all of your eyes, those of you who have your cameras on, it's totally fine if you don't. But I want you to know that I might not know you in person yet. Some of you I do, but I might not know you in person yet, but I feel like I know you. Because every one of us writers, wherever we are currently on that whole crazy journey, we have this longing, we have this desire to tell something true from within us. And whether that's a true fiction story or a true memoir or a true um, book that's meant to help others through their own transformation, it's true. And what I like to say in my book, The Creative Cure, um, is that when we begin to realize that the most creative undertaking you'll ever embark upon is becoming yourself, you. It's not the book you write. It's not when you become a published writer, when you become a speaker, it's actually becoming yourself. And then what comes from the truth of who you are and writing is one of those practices of self-discovery, of self-acceptance, of transformation. The person you are as you're in the middle of writing something or at the beginning of writing it or afraid to write it is going to become a different person as you write it. So the act of writing is part of that act of self-discovery. And that becomes this thing where you begin to become more curious about this strange, interesting creature called you, right? And as you become that much more curious about that, what you do is you open space around yourself for transformation, for becoming who you really are. And then the books that you write, the stories that you write, the screenplays, the Instagram posts, those become more and more valuable because creativity, one of the definitions of creativity is the act of producing something rare, original, and valuable. And listen, the books that you want to write or whatever version of writing will never be more valuable than the act of finding out and creating who you are and want to become. So I wanna share a, a screen thing here. I'm seeing some thank yous. I, I always get emotional talking with you and feeling you and being with you on these things because you guys, I came through, by the way, I live in Idaho. So you guys is a non-gender specific term, kind of like y'all would be in Texas. Um, so um, my very first, real thing I said when I was 10 years old to my parents, I want to be a writer. I came out of the bedroom. I was raised in a Christian cult and we didn't have television and all these things, which by the way, I'm so grateful for uh, looking back at it, even though I'm no longer part of that deal. Um, but we read all the time. And so I came out of my bedroom one night after reading a book that I'd read probably 12 times. And I told my parents, I want to be a writer. And, you know, that was the first time I'd said FBI agent, various other things. Um, when I was younger, that was the very first thing that rang this great big gong inside of me, right? 
I'm like, oh, I want to do that. But you guys, I promptly forgot that for the next 25 years of my life and went off and tried to become rich and tried to become responsible and an adult and all these things. And what happened though, was when I found my way back to it through the work of Julia Cameron in the artist's way, through bird by bird, through some of Sark's quotes that would float across the screen on social media, that's, it began to be this sense of, if I can find my way back, I am going to start crying. If I can find my way back to this dream that I had as a child, I can find something that's real and worth it because I had just come through the loss of everything at age 35. Um, the businesses I'd started, the house, all this stuff. And I want you to know that my heart is with you in whatever version of that. And hopefully it's nowhere near as horrible <laughs> as my experience was of finding myself. I think it could be a lot more gentle, but I want you to know that what you're doing here with yourself, with us together, it matters. You matter. And I'm going to share my screen real quick so you can see some other things we have coming up very soon at Heal Plus Create. Um, and I'll make sure that this is in a follow-up email and things like that. So this was what we just did, the Q&A with Annie. And then I have silent writing coming up um, very soon. I think that's this weekend. Yeah. And that's where we get together and write. And I have a few words to start us off with. Um, not necessarily a prompt, just sort of get us into the brainwave state together. And then we write for an hour. And I just finished writing a short book by longhand that I only did during the silent writing session. So we'll talk about that on Sunday. Um, we have therapeutic doodling for fun and healing with Karen Channing. That's uh, the 13th journaling the possible with Linda Monk. I'm so excited about this. She's the head of the international association of journal writers. And she did this session for a virtual retreat we did earlier this year in February, and it is amazing. So please come to that Tao yin yoga qigong with Paul David Shea. Again, amazing. Um, this is gentle movement and breathing. And you, you might say, well, what do some of these things have to do with creativity? And this is what it has to do with creativity. Heal plus create. In some cases, we actually need to heal the connection to our sensing selves, to our inner selves, to our bodies, to where we're listening to our intuition and how we're even feeling. Many of us were shut down on that early in life. And so some of these practices simply are meant to help you come back into your body in a safe way and then begin to listen to the wisdom that already lives inside of you. Then we also have another silent writing and then this one, Breathe Your Way Home. It's a special breath work session with Scott Stabil, dear friend of mine, my podcast partner. So these are some of the things that I wanted you to be aware of at healcreate.org. And then you can just click the events um, tab. And then we also have a bunch of articles on the site, and I wanted you to be aware of that um, by a variety of people, including me, uh, Julia Cameron, Lauren Sapala. Um, we have some by Julia, I mentioned that just a moment ago, some other psychologists and healers. So I just wanted you to be aware of some of the resources that we have, and we'll be sharing more about this as we go. Um, I am watching your comments coming in right now. Um, and I just want to say how much I appreciate you. Thank you for being here today. Those of you who are catching this by replay, I also mean that for you. Um, and I am looking so much forward to connecting with you during the pre-event stuff and then at the retreat. Um, can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. Um, I love you all. Thanks for being here and uh, watch your email for more stuff. We'll see you soon.